and see what happens. Okay. Carlos Leva, I'm the CEO of Three Lions, the publisher of the Hippo Survival Guide. I'm also an attorney and managing partner with the Digital Business Law Group. Um, here's our, our agenda for today now. Uh, just a few housekeeping items. We always, as a matter of practice now, send out the slides just prior. I think, Martin, what do we do? A couple hours before the, the webinar? Uh, they went out at 9 o'clock this morning. Oh, okay. So, uh, because we always get requests after the webinar that, that uh, someone didn't get the slides. And normally, you'll need to check your spam folder or your junk folder or something. The chances are uh, that it went in that big bucket. Uh, if not, then you can email us and we will be happy to uh, send you the slides, but you really should you should have them in hand uh, generally before we get started. So we're going to cover the learning objectives for today, a little bit of background. Really, the the focus is obviously on risk assessments, the vocabulary, the methodology, the timing, responsible parties, uh, and Q and A. But we're going to do like we normally do and take Q and A as we go. We just think that's a more effective way um, to do it. Uh, also, I know that some of you uh, don't. Um, can't stick around until um, you know we get to the formal Q&A and you may miss this announcement but we were having uh, our first surviving a HIPAA audit seminar in beautiful Tampa Bay on October 9th where we're going to have an all-day uh, live seminar um, and really cover the uh, each one of the 169 audit protocol requirements that HHS has put out. Uh, and the information related to the seminar is in your slides. Those that stay with us will uh, will get that announcement as part of uh, the shameless plug. But uh, if you are interested, uh, the information is in the slides. So today's learning objectives is to provide a foundational understanding of risk assessments under the HIPAA security rules. So uh, keep in mind that really a risk assessment is actually conducting a risk assessment is actually one implementation specification of the HIPAA security rule. And I know that um, a lot of times because of the importance of risk assessments, because you know that if you get audited, you are going to be asked about risk assessments, it uh, looms larger than the other 17 or 18 implementation specifications, but in fact, it's one implementation specification, one of four related to the first standard uh, in the security rule. So with respect to risk assessments, you really do need to learn the lingo. You need to learn the grammar before you're comfortable uh, with either doing your own reporting, talking about it, or uh, even just better leveraging outside help if you decide to get outside help to perform uh, a risk assessment, maybe your first couple. Okay, and we're going to talk about an, a, a methodology here that's agile, repeatable, uh, and verifiable so that you can get better and better at doing risk assessments over time. And one of the things that I want to stress today is, look, do a risk assessment even if it's wrong because you're going to learn from it and the objective uh, it, uh, is not to do a perfect academically perfect because there's no such thing, risk assessment. It's to do one and to learn from it, especially if you're a small to mid-sized uh, business associate covered entity. Uh, and, and what I feel like is a lot of people just throw up their hands and say, this is just way too complicated, we can't do it, we don't have time, and stick your head in the sand, which is guaranteed to get you a find of willful neglect, either if you get audited or more likely if you get audited um, as a result of a breach. Because the probability that you have a breach is much, much higher. It's really not uh, if you have a breach, it's when you have a breach. So you will uh, sooner or later be audited and have to deal with it. And if you say you've never done a risk assessment, well, you're pretty much dead in the water. Uh, we're going to talk about timing, significant changes, a timing of risk assessments. Really, you're not going to do one. You should probably be doing at, at a minimum one once a year, you know, and if you were doing this and trying to keep up with the changing changing threat landscape, you probably should be doing one once a quarter. And, you know, th there is actually a legitimate case where you could be doing real-time uh, uh, risk assessments. We're not talking about that today. We're talking about 
helping you understand and get through uh, your first one or improve the process if you've already done uh, a risk assessment. So timing, um, definitely, you know, at a minimum, at a gross minimum once a year. But anytime your operational environment uh, or applicable law changes, and with all the consolidation that's happening in the healthcare industry, your operational environment is changing all the time. You know, mergers and acquisitions, and even you know the famous case of moving, moving and picking up all your gear and moving somewhere else. That's a change in your operational environment that would trigger um, the need for another risk assessment. Talk about who the responsible parties are here, who's on the hook, the compliance officer and the executive team for sure, and really provide organizational stakeholders with, with a sense of how your HIPAA risk assessment should be conducted now that HIPAA is no longer a paper tiger, you know, where there's real uh, serious fines that can be levied. So with that, here is the um, three-legged stool. Uh, and if you're looking at um, the big picture of what you would be audited on, this is what you would be audited on, the HIPAA privacy rule, the HIPAA security rule, the HIPAA breach, or the high tech really, breach notification rule. When we're talking about risk assessments, though, we're really now, you know, uh, narrowing in on, focusing on that one implementation specification of the security rule. So, and because a risk assessment is not something, it's not a one-time event. This is something that you really got to sort of get used to is, is that you're going to be doing, if you're a compliance officer, you're going to be doing risk assessments, you know, for the rest of your career. It's, it's an important part of what you do, and you certainly don't want to be in a place where you've never done one, uh, never gotten started, because that's woeful neglect land. You want to be in the middle where you're continually developing your risk assessment good story by getting better and better at doing a risk assessment. Again, so perfection is not the goal, right? You're just not going to get dinged for not having a perfect risk assessment. You're going to get dinged really, really hard if you just stuck your head in the sand and didn't do one, right? And fully compliant is just really an aspirational goal. You're going to be working not just on risk assessments, but on your compliance initiative over time. It's an evergreen process. So Fully compliant is really an aspirational goal. Any any good auditor is always going to find something uh, to complain about. That's that's what auditors do. So, Martin, I'm just going to stop here. Are there any questions? There probably aren't at this point, but I'm going to ask. No, there are not. Um, okay. Very good. So I will continue. So we, you know, we talked about getting comfortable with the lingo and I am not going to um, read each one of these. I am going to focus on some that are really, really important and important to um, our methodology, how we recommend that you go about doing a risk assessment. They're all important. But you can read you can read these definitions yourself, so you don't need me to sort of uh, read them for you. But one concept here is an asset, right? An asset is a thing, tangible or intangible, that accesses stores, maintains, or transmits EPHI, network servers, mobile devices, information systems, buildings, rooms, all these things are assets, okay? And security controls get applied to assets, right? So you have to have, uh, at, at a minimum, you have to have an inventory of your assets that do something with EPHI, right? So that everybody can get started on, right? You get started on that inventory process, and you're, what, what are you inventorying these assets? that touch electronic PHI. Now, what, what, what's an attack? Well, an attack, you know, we all know it is going to be broadly defined. It's really any kind of malicious activity that attempts to collect, disrupt, deny, degrade, or destroy information system resources or the EPHI itself. And here, information system is really, really broad to include almost everything that we just talked about vis-a-vis -vis assets networks, servers, systems, etc. Authentication, right? So authentication is just a critical bottom line, baseline 
um, concept that you have to understand if you're going to assess risk is you have to have the ability to verify the identity of a user, a process, or a device, right? Is this user, uh, is she or he who they say they are? And how do we know that, right? And are you using one-factor authentication versus two-factor authentication, et cetera, right? So it, it's, it, it's a fundamental concept. And one of the things that I would add is in, in, in this age where there's a real big push to share data, not only for me meaningful use, but because sharing data now is an important concept within, within uh, accountable care organizations and you know within the changing paper performance uh, reimbursement model that CMS is uh, has adopted and is pushing quite hard. You need to be able to authenticate that when when systems are talking to other systems, is that system that you're allowing access to is that system uh, authenticated? Are they who they say they are, and how do you know? What are they providing you to be able to? Um, determine that this is an authenticated agent, electronic agent, that you're going to allow into your uh, network. Exploitation is a result of a specific threat. We'll get to um, quickly here what, what we mean by a, a specific threat triggering a given vulnerability. Okay, so when you are looking at a risk assessment, you are looking at threat vulnerability pairs and the exploitation is at that intersection of a, of a threat being exposed by a given vulnerability and some attack taking advantage of that. Um, the impact is going to be of, of the exploitation here is going to be the magnitude of the harm. Now one of the things that I think puts people off, and it's not a requirement, and we're going to see that it's not a requirement, is this is not a mathematical exercise. When you're assigning risk, uh, probabilities, et cetera, you're, it's a subjective high, medium, and low. This is not a mathematical exercise, and this protocols have long um, accepted and identified that that's really just an impossibility, right? And so you're not you're not looking at any advanced mathematics here. You're really looking at common sense judgments as to what is high, medium, or low for a probability, for impact, for risk. And we'll see how that calculation happens as part of our uh, methodology. What do we mean by integrity? Guarding against improper EPHI modification or destruction. This one I highlight because this one is crazy, is crazy hard to do. I mean, it's a requirement, but, you know, how, I mean, how, do, you, how do you actually track, you know, that, um, EPHI was not modified or destroyed uh, uh, by someone maliciously. I mean, obviously, this this how you track it is you authenticate, maybe you encrypt. You, I mean, there's lots of things that you can do, but you, you know, uh, at the end of the day, accounting for the fact that one or two bytes or ten bytes or something of a record got changed is um, is is a non-trivial task, and you don't really you can't really attack it directly. You attack it by having all these other processes uh, in place that help you with that problem. The likelihood here uh, is a weighted factor based again on a subjective analysis of the probability, and we'll talk more about that as we go. Okay, so what are you what are you protecting your assets? But Part of um, uh, part of another category of things that you're also protecting are your operations, or um, in IT speak, sometimes it's really uh, identified as your workflows. Okay, so your business processes and workflows that interact with EPHI. So obviously, when you have a patient uh, visit, you're capturing um, EPHI. When you're transmitting something to a pharmacy, you're uh, transmitting e EPHI, you have all kinds of touch points that uh, involve interaction with EPHI both within the organization and external to the organization. Uh, the concept of operational controls or the security controls really 
another way of thinking about them is the safeguards or countermeasures for an information system. Now, here's why the here's why the lingo is important. Here's why you can also lose track of the forest for the trees. Um, when you get into the lingo, is that you know really security control? These are sort of you know little fancy words, but you know a security control. For example, a password for every application that you log into, or when you log into your network, that's security control. Okay, uh, having the right policies and procedures in place, that's security control. So it, it's really um, not as abstract sometimes as the, as the new grammar may make it seem. Uh, what's your operational environment? It's the physical, technical, and organizational setting in which an information system operates. Now, why is this grammar important? Is because this is the way this is the way security people talk. This is the way IT consultants talk. Right? This is the way that an auditor is probably going to talk to you when you uh, when you're audited. So it's uh, imperative, really, you know, to get just the fundamental definitions of key words down. So risk is obviously at the core of all this, right? It's all the security rule is all about managing electronic risk. So the definition of risk. The net mission impact, considering the probability that a particular threat will exercise, accidentally trigger, or intentionally exploit a specific vulnerability, and the resulting impact, if this should occur, and the resulting impact is impact to the organization. What's it going to do to our operations? What is, what's it going to do to our business? If this if, if this particular threat vulnerability uh, pair is exploited, is it, um, are we going to lose a lot of EPHI? Are our systems going to go down? You know, how are we going to determine, how are we going to assign a value of high, medium, and low to uh, the risk associated with that event? Well, risk assessment really is everything we're talking about today. Um, now, th there's one thing that you should understand as well, because this is often confusing, um, and in uh, HHS, well, not really HHS. Well, yes, I guess HHS, because you know our Congress publishes the statutes, and the HHS publishes the regulations. Now we talk about the regulations, the privacy rule, security rule, and all that is if it were the law, and it is, but that law is agency-written law, in this case, Health and Human Services, based on the statutes, right? And Congress gives the agencies, empowers the agencies to develop regulations. And then we come to know the regulations really as all we think of, uh, of what we think of as the law, when it's really this pair of statutes and regulations. But in the case of the security rule, that's an agency-developed rule. And, and in a risk assessment, you don't, you are assessing risk, but you're not doing the implementation. It's really a, a documentation, a, a, a specific kind of documentation exercise, but you're actually not implementing the security controls for the risks that you've identified in the risk assessment implementation and specification. So a risk assessment is a pure analytical process. That's why you can do a you, you can do a quote unquote successful risk assessment even if it's wrong because what does it mean to have a wrong risk assessment? Well it means that your maybe your analytics weren't as good as they should have been, but that's probably true for every organization on the planet that tries one of these things, right? And so that's what you got to do. You got to get off the dime and start learning how to do these things. And so, do one or two or three, even if it's wrong, you get better at it. Okay, um, do one or two or three, even if you don't have the budget to do one the way you think you should. Right? Do one anyway because there are things that you can do and that you can legitimately say, "I did a risk assessment." Now, the actual implementation of those controls is done under the security rule in the second implementation specification for the first standard, which is risk management. 
okay? So risk management is a comprehensive global organizational process. You frame the risk, you assess the risk, you respond to the risk, you monitor the risk. It's a process. Risk management is step two, you can see here, is assessing the risk. Well, what is that? That's a risk assessment. That's just a recursive. So the second implementation specification, risk management, kind of swallows the entirety of the security rule. And that's where you know that a risk assessment is not a one-time thing because it's included uh, in the risk management implementation specification and, and the steps are steps that you, in the risk management uh, specification are steps that you perform over and over again, and one of them is to assess the risk. Risk mitigation, risk monitoring, risk response, I think these are pretty much self-explanatory. Security controls, the management, operational, and technical controls. So remember, when we talk about security controls uh, in the abstract, it's not just technical stuff. It's not just two-factor authentication or making sure that everybody logs off of an application that hasn't been used for more than 20 seconds or, right? Your management operational uh, controls are security controls as well. So, for example, documenting according to how the security rule uh, requires you to document is a security uh, control, right? There's a lot, it's a lot broader than you would think. So. Because the security rule is so technically oriented, I think people lose track of the fact that there are these process things um, that need to be done as part of the security rule that, that are not really specifically technology-centric at all. Single point of failure is not a, a term that is um, specifically mentioned uh, in the security rule, at least not that I know of, but it's uh, a potential risk posed by a design or implementation flaw of a system or of a group of systems that can compromise operational availability. So obviously when you're looking at your disaster recovery plan as part of your uh, security rule, you're, you're looking at trying to uh, eliminate single points of failure because those are the things that are going to, uh, at a minimum, bring your operations down in some way, shape, or form. Now the concept of security objects is really, really important because security objects are what security controls get applied to. And security objects are what you need to have an inventory of so that you can do a risk assessment. It's really step one, as we'll see. So you need a uh, inventory of your operations, your workflows, you need an inventory of all the individuals that make up your workforce, and you need an inventory of your assets. And remember, we just defined assets when we got started was uh, an asset can be an information system, a network, a PC, a phone, anything that touches EPHI is an asset. Okay, so those are security objects, and security objects are what security controls uh, are applied to. Technical controls is just differentiating security controls from other types of controls, okay, from management controls, operational controls. Uh, the definition of a threat, the potential for a person or thing to exercise, accidentally trigger or intentionally exploit a specific vulnerability. We have natural threats, which include floods, earthquakes, etc. human threats, uh, which we're all aware of, and environmental threats. Okay, and these are just somewhat, you know, arbitrary. We don't need to, you don't really need to get too uh, worked up on, you know, whether it's a natural threat or a human threat. I mean, these things are just kind of common sense kind of categories. Um, the threat landscape is a, a term that you'll hear a lot because it's really, what are the threats out there in the wild that are happening in real time? capable of exploiting vulnerabilities in your operational environment. And, and as you can imagine, the threat landscape changes on a daily, hourly basis. The bad guys are getting better and better at doing what they do. And this is one of the reasons that, you know, doing a risk assessment once a year is the absolute minimum. You really should be doing it. You know, there's an argument that could be made that you could be doing part of a risk assessment on a daily basis, right? So 
uh, probably quarterly is some kind of minimum. And the security rule doesn't say right how often. It says that it's a process and it's repeatable, but it doesn't say how often. So it's up to you to pick. And I'm suggesting here, if you're going to pick and you're on a short budget, and you know, or or you got a lot of resistance in the organization, and you just don't have the bandwidth, etc. Minimum, minimum is is like once a year. Okay. A vulnerability. What is a vulnerability? It's a flaw or weakness in the system security procedures, design, implementation, or, or uh, internal controls that can be exploited. Some sort of flaw or weakness that can be exploited. Okay, so before we jump into methodology, I'm going to stop again and, and ask Martin, is there any, are there any questions? We have one question right now, and that is, what is the difference between a risk analysis and a risk assessment? I, I, you know, I think for all intents and purposes, those are just two terms that are synonymous and thrown around. You know, I... I I believe if you go look at the security rule, the implementation specification may actually say risk analysis, and but everybody talks about it as a risk assessment. So it's a distinction without a difference. Same thing for all, for all intents and purposes. If you want to specifically identify with respect to the security rule what it is that we're talking about, we're talking about implementation specification one under the first standard of the HIPAA security rule, and we'll, we'll see that um, in a second here, how that's defined. So one of the things we want to back up and get a big picture view of is really what are we trying to do with a risk assessment, right? What are we trying to accomplish? I mean, other than it's a necessary evil and you got to do it because the regulations say, really, in this day and age where um, Everyone, every industry, and, and yes, healthcare has been slow to get there, but now the, 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 the change from an IT perspective in healthcare is, you know, I like to say that healthcare has gone through 150 years of change in five. I mean, it's exploding, right? And so basic security literacy is just something you have to do as part of your business. We need to transform the thinking of compliance as this necessary evil into something that we do that protects our organization and helps deliver value to our customers. So what are we trying to do? Well, one of the things that we're trying to do is Katrina-proof your practice, okay? We're, we're trying to eliminate risk, and one of the risks is, you know, one visual of risk is you can think of Katrina, and what happened during Katrina, 66% uh, or more of um, Healthcare providers, covered entities, lost data. Okay, and you know, I mean, not only healthcare providers, right? But I mean, you saw the, all the war stories, the flooding, etc., uh, etc. Et and that's one of the things that we're trying to do. That's one risk. That's an environmental risk. Um, uh, and I actually, Katrina was probably all the risk combined uh, in the one. But so that's one way of thinking about it. So we want to harden. We want to harden your operational environment, right? That's one of the things that we're trying to do. We're also trying to reduce risk to levels that are reasonable and appropriate, okay? And those are the what I call the weasel words in, this, in the security rule. The security rule says, well, you know, how do you know when you're there? Well, you're supposed to develop reduce risk until – at levels that are reasonable and appropriate for an organization of your size, complexity, revenue, etc. Okay, now these are really, really weasel words because what you know, what, what's reasonable and appropriate for your organization won't be for the next organization, even if it's the same size, probably. And ultimately, that'll be determined by an HHS auditor or a court of law, right? So there's a lot of wiggle room into what's reasonable and appropriate. For example. Encryption is not mandated by the security rule. So you could technically be in compliance uh, with the security rule and not encrypt. But if you had a big breach and you're being sued in some class action lawsuit, let's say, for negligence, and the question is asked, uh, is what you did, are the steps that you took, were they reasonable and appropriate? you're going to have a hard time probably answering yes if you didn't encrypt at some level, right? That's just because 
encryption is going to is becoming more and more an important baseline thing to do. All right, so you got to be careful with these weasel words that are in the security rule. You, you, you at the end of the day, if, if it turns into an audit or a suit, you have a big, you have a bad breach. These weasel words are going to be used against you. It's not. It's not, this concept of doing a risk assessment is not this. You know, check off all these ticky marks, right? Uh, now that's part of it. And even if it's wrong, you know, we encourage you to go ahead and check some of them off. At the end of the day. Did you do what was reasonable and appropriate? It's probably the question that's going to be asked. So now we like um, to recommend and use internally an agile methodology. And agile is a, a methodology um, process, way of thinking, way of doing things that, that uh, actually came out of urban planning and then was really taken over in a big big way by the software industry and now has morphed into lots of other uh, industries where Agile has been applied. And we like to think about Agile compliance. Uh, and so just a little black background here, this is why we say do a risk assessment even if it's wrong because you're going to learn something from it and you're going to understand the problem better just by doing it. So it turns out that most technology projects and the security rule uh, it is more than a technology project, but a lot of a lot of people tend to think of the security rule as a as solely a technology project. Uh, project. So you need to understand that most technology projects fail because of people and process challenges. Okay, they have very little to do with the underlying technologies, and hopefully we're going to make that clear here. You, you you can do a risk assessment without having sophisticated technology or expensive technology. Okay, or um, is it the best? Well, you know, the best is not the requirement. So uh, yes, you could get better using some sophisticated technology, but that's not really uh, necessarily the, the primary requirement. Uh, a, a security rule implementation is more aptly described as a change project, really, especially now when HIPAA has real teeth and just this 24-7, 365 online technology-driven world that we live in. This is really about changing the organization's culture, learning how to conduct Effective risk assessments is just a big part of that change because the world has changed. Okay, we're not just we're not living in the same world. Obviously, even when HIPAA was promulgated back in 1996 and went into effect in uh, 2004 and 2005, right? The world has dramatically changed from a a technology uh, landscape, from a threat landscape perspective, etc. So, an iterative agile methodology uh, is required uh, to get there. Okay. And so at what we think of as agile compliance is a group of methods based on an iterative and incremental approach. It, you know, it's going to require evolutionary development and implementation. Right? Get started um, will be the theme here. Okay? This agile methodology acknowledges that due to a changing technical and regulatory environment, the implementation cycle never ends. Okay? So this is another concept. It's an evergreen process. It's can't look at compliance as something that has a beginning, middle, and end because it doesn't. It's not a one-time event. And we like to think of agile compliance as actually as an or as how an organization goes about changing its compliance DNA. So this was captured a long time ago by the management consultant Tom Peters in a completely different context. Um, and I, I believe this came out of one of his early books, like In Search of uh, In Search of Excellence. Uh, or if not that one, thriving on chaos. But it's this idea of fail forward fast, which means ultimately means the quickest way to success is to fail forward fast. Go ahead and make some mistakes and learn as you go, and that's how you eventually uh, acquire, obtain success. However, success is, is uh, defined. The 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 problem. The challenge in the healthcare industry with agile is this concept of fail forward fast is um, not how the healthcare industry likes to view what it does because of the scientific background of the healthcare industry. You know, the, the whole thing about, hey, we're so much different than everybody else because people die here and blah, blah, blah. We have to have this scientific method way of dealing with things. And it turns out that, that well, that's obviously true in certain areas. It's not true in other areas. Uh, and compliance, I would say, would be one of them. And there's lots of other areas where agile really applies. And you really should fail forward fast because there's way too many things in healthcare that we don't understand well enough. Um, so 
Anyway, why? Why fail forward fast? Because it's the only way to attack a wicked problem. Okay, and a wicked problem is one that has the following characteristics, and I'm going to here to tell you that a, a security rule implementation, a risk assessment, your first risk assessment, and this whole compliance uh, initiative now, you're dealing with a wicked problem. Not wicked as in evil, but wicked as in hard. And the reason that it's wicked hard is, one, is you don't understand the problem until you start developing a solution. You're really not going to understand what it takes to do a risk assessment just by, you know, hearing me speak on this webinar. You're going to have to attack the problem and actually start doing it uh, before you even start getting a clue as to what you're doing in a risk assessment, okay? There's no stopping rule to a wicked hard problem. So there's no definitive problem. How do you know when you how do you know when you finished? You know, how, how do you know when you've gotten as good as you're going to get to your risk assessments, right? Well, you're, you're never going to know. It's just going to keep getting better, you know? And the solutions are not right or wrong. They're just better than others or worse or good enough. Okay, every wicked problem is unique and novel. Every solution is a one set operation. So we're dealing with another way of thinking about wicked problems is that, we're, you know, wicked problems deal with um, challenges that have social and organizational complexity. Okay, and it turns out that although uh, management may still be you know, thinking in the old HIPAA universe where, where HIPAA was a paper tiger and had no teeth, and in the old universe where technology wasn't so central to what healthcare does, um, you know, and so their, their, their thinking is not right for the new model, and you got to change the thinking before you're ever going to have any success, and you got to change the organization's thinking and DNA vis-a-vis -vis compliance, right? Not as this other add-on, bolt-on, necessary evil thing. And that is uh, a challenge that is a non-trivial challenge. That is that's that challenge embodies social and organizational complexity. That's at the heart of why we push an agile methodology because that's what you're up against. Uh, as compliance officers. So it turns out that big problems like doing an effective risk assessment, like a security rule implementation, like your enti the entirety of your HIPAA initiative, big problems require lots of small solutions. Do something even if it's wrong. Which is another way of saying just get started. Okay, We're trying to provide some tools. Get started doing your risk assessment so that at a minimum, should that auditor ask you the question, you can say, yes, we've done one. Here were the results. Here's what we did. Here's where we think we could improve, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, I'm going to take another quick breath here, Martin, and just stop and see. Um, we don't have any questions at this time. You're mesmerizing them. Okay, so... There was a question earlier about the difference between a risk analysis and a risk assessment. It's a good question, right? Here's what we're talking about, though. Okay, so if you specifically want to identify, we're talking about security rule implementation 164.308.a1.i. This is the first standard security management process. Okay, and and you know that uh, well, maybe you don't, but most of you probably do uh, have at least a cursory understanding of the security rule is that security rule is made up of standards and each one of those standards have, well most, have one or more implementation specifications. Here, security management process, that's standard number one, okay? And that standard says that you should implement policies and procedures to prevent, detect, contain, and correct security violations. That's like, right, that swallows the rule. That's the whole darn thing. Uh, in one standard almost. Now, the first implementation specification for this standard is a risk assessment, and it's required, right? And uh, the security rule has two types of implementation specifications. So, some are labeled required, which means exactly what it says. You absolutely have to do it. And some are labeled addressable, which is really probably a misnomer. Maybe HHS would want to mulligan and take that back because an addressable implementation specification doesn't mean that you can ignore it. 
It means that you need to implement it as is, or you need to implement an alternative for your organization, or you need to have a damn good reason why, and document that damn good reason why you decided to do nothing at all for this addressable implementation specification. Okay? Turns out, though, for standard number one, they're all required. So if you're thinking about risk assessment, and I believe you you can click on the sides and you can go out to the, the, the rule itself to read it. So anywhere you see a URL uh, in the PDF uh, containing the slides, you can go out to the HIPAA survival guide and get the full source. source. So what is implementation specification one for standard number one? It requires you to conduct an accurate and thorough assessment of the potential risk and vulnerabilities to the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of EPHI, right? That's what you're trying to do in a risk assessment. So here are the four. Here are the four for standard number one. Okay, here are the four implementation specifications. One is a risk assessment. The second one is risk management, which really, like I said before, swallows the rule because it also includes a risk assessment. Uh, the third one is the sanction policy for sanctioning your uh, employees when they violate the security rule, which means that you at least at a minimum have to understand what a, a violation of a, the security rule looks like. And uh, specification number four, activity review, which is reviewing your information systems, operations, and things like that to determine whether or not, um, usually whether or not the confidentiality, integrity, availability of e, uh, EPHI has been compromised. So no wiggle room here in standard number one. They're all required. Obviously today we're just going to focus on risk assessment. I just want to point out though and where in what context, this is probably the single most important standard of the security rule. This is clearly where an auditor is going to focus. Yes, they're all going to, and they're probably more than likely going to focus on the first two implementation specifications of risk assessment uh, and risk management because, again, risk management kind of swallows the rule. And when I, when I mean swallows the rule, I mean contains the almost the entirety of security rule was almost contained in that one implementation specification called risk management because at the end of the day that's what you're doing that's what the security rule is all about so these are the steps to a risk assessment we're going to cover them at a high level and then we're going to cover them at a lot more detail okay the second pass the first step is gather data it's an inventory process, right? So step one in the risk assessment is to gather data in order to document your as-is, what your operational look, uh, environment looks like today with, with, with respect to what? With respect to your operations, think of operations as workflows, with respect to your assets, and with respect to individuals or your workforce, okay? So it's an inventorying process. Not really a whole lot of technology related to that, right? Get started and gather the inventory of these things, of operations, assets, and individuals, and you, you could make a good faith argument that you've at least started your risk assessment. Now, step two turns out to be um, a lot more complicated, especially the first time you look at it, right? And hopefully we will we'll, we'll get through at least an explanation where it at least is less complicated, maybe, and you can get your mind around it. Step two is identify threats and vulnerabilities, okay? So gather threats and vulnerabilities because as we'll talk about in our risk model later, it's threat and vulnerability pairs that you're always looking at. Those are things that an attack will exploit. You're always gonna be looking at a threat vulnerability pair. So you gotta gather the threats and the vulnerabilities that pertain to your operational environment. You need, by gather, you need to identify them, right? Which you will subsequently associate security objects um, identify as security objects and you'll you'll you will apply security controls to those security objects okay so um, you're going to link them to security objects and really the security objects are just your 
operations, right, your workflow, your assets, and your individuals, right, and that's what you apply security controls to. But this is probably the, the hardest step to get your mind around is, okay, you know, I'm really not an, an IT person. How do I go about identifying what the threats and vulnerabilities are? And hopefully we'll give you some guidance here. Uh, because there are lots of uh, TNVs that are common to practices of all sizes, so there's really no need to reinvent the wheel. There's just some basic known threats and vulnerabilities out there, and that's a good place to start. Step three is to assess your the current security controls that you have in place. Now, you know, even if you have the worst operational environment from a security rule perspective in the world, you probably have more security controls in place than you realize. You know, I mean, you have logins for your networks, you have logins and passwords for each application. You know, you got some basic things that your vendors just help you with, right? So you have some security controls already in place. So step three is to assess your current security controls and minimize or eliminate risk to EPHI based on well-functioning security controls. In other words, you're probably already eliminating some threats and vulnerabilities because at a minimum you have some security controls in place, this step is, 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 is it's really it's another uh, uh, inventorying step, except in this, kind, in this uh, step, it's you're inventorying what are the security controls that you already have in place. And remember when we talked about the definitions, and you can go back and look at that, security controls is really broader. They're not just technical. They're management and operational. So you could go down each one of the um, for example, documentation things, uh, uh, requirements of the security rule, you know, are you capturing security incidents and blah, 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 and, and uh, you know, identify that as a, a, a potential control uh, that you have in place, because without that, you know, how could you ever report a breach? So, again, you know, what do you have in place today? This is what this step three is asking. Step four is... It assumes that you've identified, it assumes that you've gathered the inventory, okay? It assumes that you've identified threat and vulnerability pairs, and then it's asking to, for you to determine the likelihood that a specific threat will exploit a particular vulnerability, right? So review the threat vulnerability pairs uh, that are relevant to your operational environment and assign a subjective probability value, high, medium, or low, that the threat in question will actually exploit its, co its corresponding vulnerability. So you could have a threat that says, you know, we live in um, Hurricane Alley. So we definitely have a threat of being hit by hurricanes, and hurricanes can uh, obviously uh, take the grid down, so we don't have any electricity. But you know what, in our hospital or our uh, operational environment, we have double redundant um, electricity backups, right, that can get us through 8 or 16 or 24 hours worth of not having the grid up. So yes, we have the threat, you know, uh, and obviously the threat of the grid the threat of the grid going down is a universal threat, right, whether you're in Hurricane Alley or not. But the likelihood of that threat actually exploiting the vulnerability in our environment is low because we have this dun uh, double redundant um, uh, electricity supply, right? We, we don't have a single point of failure here. We have our own redundancy that will kick in if if the our primary source of electricity goes down. So once you identify the probability, remember we're using these terms that that appear to have a mathematical um, you know connotation to it, but really the probability, as we saw, was subjective, high, medium, or low. Okay. Once you've identified the probability, you want to calculate the impact that an exploitation will have on your operational environment. All right. And the impact is, encompasses the magnitude of the harm. And again, the impact is going to be measured high, medium, or low. And the impact goes something like this. If this threat actually exploited this vulnerability, what is that going to do to our operations? What is it going to do to our practice? Well, in the case of when the grid goes down, Right, 
you're pretty much dead in the water. I mean, it's, you know, yes, maybe you can go back to, uh, uh, you know, your paper charts or something, but, you know, it's going to be hard to function if you don't have uh, any juice, right? Take, for example, in a case where your EHR um, vendor is on the cloud and, you know, and you lost your Internet access because, you, because all the electricity uh, went down and you don't have any backup internet access that might be through Wi-Fi, the magnitude is going to be pretty high. And that's what you would say, low, medium, or high, you give it a, a probability value of low, medium, or high. And you, you describe what it would do if, if that threat actually exploited that vulnerability, what's the impact to your operational environment, what's the magnitude of the harm. And then step six is then, well then, the determine the level of risk associated with that threat vulnerability pair. This is a little redundant here, and it's just a little, you know, um, academic and abstract, but, you know, you, you struggle with it a little bit, it, it becomes clearer is, so the level of risk associated with threat vulnerability pair, taking into consideration the impact to the organization, remember that any given threat is capable of, of exploiting one or more vulnerabilities, that just means there's just not a one-to-one -one relationship between a threat and vulnerability, right? Threats could exploit lots of vulnerabilities, but when you're looking at doing this uh, probability and this impact, you're looking at a threat vulnerability pair. Once a threat vulnerability pairs are identified, then a specific risk level is quote unquote calculated, okay? Calculated as a function of the probability of the threat exploiting a specific vulnerability. And remember, if you go back a few steps, we gave that probability value of high, medium, and low, and the impact that the exploitation is likely to have. So, and we gave the impact a high, medium, or low. Okay? Then you combine a high, medium, or low probability with a high, medium, or low impact to your organization, and that's how you establish a subjective value for risk, which, as you might guess, is also given a, in, in a subjective way as high, medium, or low. Okay? And then step seven is document the new modified security controls that you need given the threat vulnerability pairs that you've identified that will help mitigate risk to levels that are reasonable and appropriate for your organization. This step only includes identification of the security controls. Remember, this is a pure analytical process. You're not actually doing the doing. You're not implementing the new security controls. You're just documenting which ones that you need. Okay. Questions now. Okay. First question. Does this only pertain to EPHI and not PHI in general? Yes. Yes, because this because the security rule is by definition only related to EPHI. Okay, um, so you're, you're it's all it's all electronic uh, at, at this point. Okay, now that that's not to say that um, like you can't have a breach of paper PHI. You certainly can. You know, it's clear that you can, and they're well documented. But when you talk about the security rule, the security rule. It is the security rule itself applies to a subset of PA, uh, of PHI, which is EPHI, electronic PHI. If the power grid goes down, EPHI is not at risk at that point. It's more of a statement than well, a question. Yeah, I, I would say it is at risk. You can't use it. How, how are you going? How are you going to uh, look up the chart? to know what this patient that just walked in the door, how do you know what meds they're taking if all that is in your EHR system and the grid went down? You can't, you don't know, but you're now, you're now in the dark. Are you going to, you know, are, are you going to uh, order a prescription not knowing what meds uh, a current patient is on so you don't know what the contraindications are? I mean, you're pretty much dead in the water. That's, I mean, you have to think about, yes. I mean, I, I get the gist of the statement is that, well, if the grid is down, then there's no, no you know, there's no harm. Nobody's going to be able to get uh, get access to it to hack it. But that's only one threat vulnerability pair. Okay, the the fact that you can't use it is right. It's also the 
it, and if you go back, this is why this is why you have to get a big picture view here before you start di diving in and losing track of the forest for the trees. Is look, you 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 go back to the definition of standard number one was you know the confidentiality, the integrity, and what was the third one? The availability. Okay, so yeah, no, your your grid goes down. You got a huge problem. Okay, is there? Any benefit or danger in using the security risk assessment tool from HHS? Yeah, it sucks. Could you be clearer on that? <laughs> Look, HHS is kind of shouldn't be in the tool business, okay? And because they they provided some rudimentary tool that doesn't really help you do a risk assessment, and then you know, as, as if it's trivialized, and you know what, if you rely on that, you're going to get dinged anyway. They shouldn't be in the tool business because they're not providing comprehensive tools that actually compete with maybe more effective tools that you could uh, that you could purchase. In fact, that tool, all it essentially does is help you, uh, quote unquote, help you gather your inventory, which you can do in a spreadsheet. I mean, that's the trivial part, actually of doing a risk assessment. It doesn't help you with the rest of this, identifying threat vulnerability pairs. It certainly doesn't explain to you any of the concepts that we're talking about today. It doesn't give you a methodology for doing it. You know, So I mean, I could go on and on as to why it sucks, but uh, I would not recommend using that tool, and HHS probably uh, did a disservice to the industry to publish it. There's, there's a comment from one of the attendees that, the tool has no sec security and cannot scale, which is probably what you just said as well. Well, uh, yeah. The, the, the one last question here is, and we're in the middle of, well, there's another one coming up. Uh, uh, can you recommend a step-by-step -step guide to how to conduct a risk assessment? This person is new to compliance. Yeah, so we, at the end, when you get to our shameless plugs, we actually have a security rule checklist. And a lot of the things that you're going to see here, and you've already seen these steps, are contained within our security rule checklist where we do a step-by-step -step guide of all these steps and how to create a, 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 how to do a risk assessment. We give you some tools and templates uh, and, and things to help you uh, get started with that process. And, you know, we, we, we deal with wetware, which is really the, the educational part of it. You know, software without wetware, you know, without knowing, um, how, right? We give you the steps, the how-to. Uh, one of the things that's wrong, not only with HHS's solution, but a lot of software solutions out there is that they're often nothing more than just uh, repositories for your results. They don't really help you conceptually get through uh, a risk assessment, which is what we're trying to do in this webinar, but which is what our, 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 our products do as well. We have risk assessment training, uh, module and we have a step-by-step -step guidance in our security rule checklist. So uh, yes, there are there are uh, uh, solutions available. Uh, there's no more questions at this time. Okay, so now we're going to go through this in a little bit more detail, right? Step one we said was gather inventory. Okay, inventory of what, right? And it, it takes this sort of, you know, going over it until these concepts start to become a little clearer. Operations business processes and workloads that interact with EPHI on a day-to-day -day basis. Just identify them, right? Use Visio to map them out, right? That, that's a good way to do it. You, see, you have to identify what your workloads are. I mean, this is just like, it really is IT 101, but you know what I mean? If you're the uh, office admin and this just got thrown in your lap, it's not IT 101. It's completely overwhelming because you just don't understand the grammar to start with. Assets, right? Just go in inventory uh, the assets, the, your mobile, your phones, your servers, your PCs, your laptops, anything that access, store, maintain, transmit the EPHI. And, you know, go out and get a list of your workforce members that access, store, maintain, transmit. That's part of the gather data. That's part of step one. Okay, so we have a, a spreadsheet here. It's hard to read. This comes as part of our tools is to help you get started. Right, here's, you know, a model office. Right, and we try to a, a select a really san, a really simple small practice sort of to walk you through what this might look like 
when you're actually trying to capture it. So you're here, um, you know, you're, you're, you're logging your PCs, your mobile phones, your laptops, you know, that's part of your hardware. You're logging software that has EPHI, your databases, your operating systems, your other applications, uh, et cetera, right? This is, you know, so a tool and template that can help you with the inventory process because that really is step one. You can't do anything until you get the inventory, okay? And here's, you know, your workforce members. When were they hired? When did they terminate? You know, when were they cleared? When were they last trained? I mean, this is not meant to be definitive. You can change these. You get, you know, with our tools, you get the, the spreadsheets, you know, and, and source. Uh, they're, they're in Excel. You just use them, right? And, and we're not really um, uh, saying this is a, a, a definitive. What we're trying to do is educate and give examples as to how you can sort of do this, right? The whole intention is that you take these tools and templates and you modify them to what you're trying to do, but at a minimum, you're not looking at a blank page. You're not looking at, okay, you know, I went to this training. What really, from a practical perspective, what on earth do I do now? Okay, and, and so our tools and templates, checklists and things like that are are intended to answer that question. So here's, you know, some workflows. You got a clinical workflow, a financial workflow, a scheduling workflow. All these workflows, you know, impact, touch EPHI. You need to capture them in, in inventory. And like I said probably map them, map drawing them visually in a, in a um, you know, you using a, a mind map or a visio map or something like that is probably a good idea. Okay, step two, kinds of threats, right? Step two was identify threats and vulnerabilities. And natural threats, we talked about Katrina proof, right? Floods, earthquakes, etc. You got human threats, just the bad guys out there that want your data. And you got environmental threats, which are you know, power failures, pollution, chemicals, all, you know, all the fires, all the other kinds of things that uh, could happen, right? Now, as part of identifying threats and vulnerabilities, you really need to ask the question is, who's the adversary here? Is it an individual? Is it a group? Is it an organization? Is it government? Is it nature, right? That conducts or has the intent to conduct detrimental activities. That's who an adversary is, right? Anybody that can hurt your operations. So threats, right? Again, here's our, here's our tools and templates. Threats is the theft of a laptop, theft of a desktop, theft of a smartphone, you know, and on and on, right? You're losing your primary uh, facility, et cetera, right? So we give you some examples that you're not just, you know, pulling your hair out. Is what is what is the threat now, and how do I identify this with a, a vulnerability? Now, th this is not comprehensive. This is educational, right? And, and it gets a lot more complex because there are, if you're really going to do this uh, effectively over time, you probably need some software that helps you, some enabling software that helps you monitor your network, make sure your systems are all patched and updated to the, uh, to you know, to the latest versions because the threat landscape has changed and the vendors have sent out all these fixes. You know, make sure that you can, um, you know, do uh, intrusion detection, there are all kinds of things like that, and the, the software to do that is becoming um, less and less, more and more affordable, right, but the technology is only a small piece of this, okay, and so you really need to understand uh, uh, the grammar and the concepts here before you can make effective use of the, tech, uh, the technology. So. Identify threats and vulnerabilities. So we have, you know, a spreadsheet that helps you identify threats. And vulnerability is, hey, desktops aren't physically locked. Desktop hard drives are not uh, encrypted. Uh, not all our devices uh, have tracking and recovery services for maybe like mobile phones. No security camera in the waiting room. No security cameras in the server room. On and on. These are current vulnerabilities that you may have, and you know what? You're just not gonna do a perfect job the first time. There is no perfect vulnerability uh, assessment, right? It, it, it's, you're gonna get better at it, that's all. Okay, if you don't have any redundant power supply, that's a vulnerability, you, you know? And so here's some ideas of how you can start capturing vulnerabilities. And like I said, do one, even if it's wrong, because you're going to learn from the process of actually thinking really hard about what the security rule is asking you to do and actually going through and doing one. And if you do that, you can make a good faith argument that you did one. 
okay? And here are the results. Here's what we found. Here's what we documented. Here's what we're well, here's what our inventory was. You can give that. You can produce that visible demonstrable evidence to an auditor, to a court of law that, hey, we didn't put our head in our sand. We actually did this. So step three was assess the security controls that you already have in place. That's the as is. What do we have in place? The management, operational, and technical controls that you already have in place, right? Prescribe for an information system broadly defined to protect the confidentiality, integrity, and availability, because that's what the standard one said we were supposed to do. So again, this is the as-is environment. So the as-is can uh, can be both security controls can be both technical and non-technical. So we talked about that, right? Technical controls include but are not limited to parts of an information system such as hardware and software, you know, automatic log off two-factor authentication, all those kinds of technical things uh, that help you with security. But there's also non-technical uh, controls, right? So technical controls, access controls, identification methods, authentication methods, encryption, automatic log off, audit controls, you know, audit controls being, you know, logs that you're capturing activity, uh, et cetera. But there are also non-technical controls. Okay, so policies, procedures, standards, guidelines, all that sort of stuff are non-technical controls um, that you have in place in your operational environment to help you deal with risk. Okay, and so if you have an effective set of policies, procedures, training, all that is really non-technical controls, you know, that you, you have in place in your operational environment to help you deal with risk. Then you have physical controls, right? Redundant power supply, redundant internet connections, uh, card access uh, to secured areas, card key access to secured areas, monitoring devices, etc. Right? There's a list of physical controls that you could have as well. So the as is, that's step three, capture security controls already in place at the information system or other computing infrastructure level, devices, networks, communication. Why are you doing this? Why are you looking at the as is? Because because you already have some things that can help you with the threats and vulnerabilities that you've identified. And, and maybe, you know, maybe the threats and vulnerabilities that now are newly identified because this is your second and third risk assessment. Okay, so you already say, hey, well, we already got some of these things in place so we can use them to deal with some of these threats and vulnerabilities. And obviously you're going to identify new security controls for threats and vulnerabilities uh, that you hadn't identified previously. All right, or that you um, that you simply just missed that you had in place, but it maybe didn't know it. Okay, so step number four was determine whether the likelihood of the threat will materialize. Will will the threat actually exploit the vulnerability? So you want to determine the probability p that a specific threat will exploit a particular vulnerability. So remember, we're looking at t and v pairs. So the organization's task is to review threat vulnerability pairs that are relevant to your operational environment and assign a subjective likelihood, probability, high, medium, or low, okay, that that threat in question will actually exploit its corresponding vulnerability. So here's a visual of that, right, and here's our risk assessment model. You have to identify threat vulnerability pairs. So threat one could be identified with vulnerability one through n, et cetera, right? When you're looking at calculating probability, you're looking at, in this particular example, T2 and V1, and you're assigning what is the probability that this threat is actually going to exploit this vulnerability. Well, that's going to depend on what security controls you have in place in your operational environment, and you're going to give that the probability as a subjective measure of high, medium, or low. Okay, That's the step that we're talking about right here, calculating the P. So here in our sample spreadsheet, we have theft of a desktop computer. The vulnerability is desktops are not physically locked. The probability is high. Now this is assuming, okay, this example assumes that obviously that the desktop computer had PHI, EPHI on it, and therefore would constitute a breach. But you know, so once you've identified the threat, and once you've identified vulnerabilities, you're really looking at threat vulnerability pairs. Okay, and then assigning a value of high, medium, or low with respect to what is the probability that this particular threat is going to exercise and exploit this particular specific vulnerability. 
So once you've done that, then you want to calculate the I, the impact to the organization. So the impact that an explo exploitation will have on your operational environment. And what you're trying to capture is the magnitude of the harm that's likely to result from this exploitation. Okay. So if you had um, this desktop computer that had EPHI in it, right, and the probability was high, uh, because you didn't have any, any any controls, it wasn't locked down. Somebody, a thief, could just walk in and, and take it. Worse yet, with a laptop, what, you know, what's that? What's that going to be? Uh, you know, what's the impact of that going to be? Well, you know, who knows? But you know, what if you had ten thousand, hundred thousand records of EPHI on that? It's probably going to be high, right? To your um, to your practice, and that's what. And this is subjective. You're going to have to. You, you're going to have to, this, in, the, in the tools to capture this, you're going to have to describe the impact. What is it going to do? What is it actually going to do to our uh, business, to our practice, if this, uh, if this exploitation happens? Okay. So now you have the I. You have high, medium, or low, and you have a description of you know what, if this exploitation happened, the impact is going to be blah, 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 and we're not going to be able to do X, Y, and Z, et cetera, okay? So you have both a high, medium, and low value and uh, of the impact, and you have some narrative that you're describing, and now you're left with calculating the R, the risk, right? Because the risk is going to be a function of probability of the exploitation and the impact to your organization. So what's the risk? So once the threat vulnerability pairs are identified, then a specific risk level R is calculated in quotes as a function of probability of a threat exploiting a specific vulnerability and the impact that exploitation is likely to have on your operation. So you're going to combine the probability times the impact gives you the risk. Remember that any given threat is capable of exploiting one or more vulnerabilities. We've covered that and therefore capable of generating a number of risks, and so you're going to combine the probability of the exploitation, the fact that it was going to be a high impact would probably give you a high risk level. That's the kind of subjective analysis you're going to go through looking at probability impact pairs to come up with your subjective high, medium, or low risk. Okay, so that's how you get to the R. And step seven was again a, a purely this is a purely analytical exercise. Document the security controls um, that will help mitigate risk to levels that are reasonable uh, and appropriate. Okay, so you're going to be documenting new security controls that you've identified that will help you manage uh, the risk to levels that are reasonable and appropriate. That's the final step of the risk assessment is what are the new what are the new controls that you've now identified that you need to have to address those risks that you've identified. So here are the steps. Gather, identify, assess, determine the probability of the exploitation of, 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 of a threat exploiting a vulnerability, determine the impact of the threat, determine the risk, and identify the controls that you need to deal with that. Nothing to it, right? Okay, Martin, we got about 15 minutes, and I'd, I'd like to stop and really try to take as much QA as possible if there's questions pending. Okay, we have uh, just two questions at this time. I'm sure we'll, well, now we got three. How do we determine if employees' computers have EPHI on them? Well, you have to inspect them, right? You have to inspect them. <laughs> there's no other way to do it. I mean, you could have a policy. That says, hey, we don't allow, we don't allow local PHI on our uh, PCs, on our laptops, on our phones. But you know, people do what you inspect, not what you expect. So you're going to have to have a, a random audits and inspections to determine if people are actually um, fulfilling the policy. Without that, you're just kind of you know whistling Dixie because you don't you don't, you don't have any way of knowing. Okay, and there's one more question. How do you inventory servers that are virtual machines in the cloud? Do we have to get the service provider to give us the actual technical information on the virtual machines and access controls, power redundancy, et cetera? 
et cetera. Yeah, yeah. Those are your assets. They just happen to be hosted by a BA, right? You got to identify those servers, you know, and you got to know what's on, what's stored on them. Yes, it can be, you know, uh, you know, incredibly, you know, uh, complex to identify virtual servers. But yes, you would be required to identify them because otherwise, how do you know? How do you know where they exist? How do you even know what building they're in? How you know what I'm saying? So you, 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 the inventory, the inventory process is not as it's not as trivial as it sounds, and that that question illustrates that. If you have a independent contractor, individual working as a business associate, how should they be held to HIPAA standards? Are they expected to perform and provide a risk assessment, or are they expected to adhere to our standards? Well, look, if, if no, though, so now, you know, business associates are directly on the hook, statutorily, okay? That's one of the things that the High Tech Act introduced. They're directly on the hook for the security rule. So if they, if they are, in the example of a cloud EHR vendor, right, if they're hosting your PHI on their systems, they're on the hook for all this. Yes, they got to perform a risk assessment. They have to do all of this, okay? Right, so there, you know, not all not all business associates are created equal, right? So you have that one example where the, you have the EHR vendor in the cloud, right? And yeah, they're 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 going to behave from a risk assessment perspective, just like all the steps we went through. If they haven't done that. If they haven't done that, and and you you and you didn't take the step to get reasonable assurances that they had done it, then you probably haven't satisfied that piece of of the security rule that that just doesn't happen to be in part of implementation specification one a risk assessment but you know you got to ask your EHR vendors what do you do if you say you're complying which you are required to comply by law now directly with the statute not only through the business associate contract but statutorily then yes they have to do that now that's different than you know your CPA that comes on site and you know he does he have to or she have to comply with the security rule yes but they're not hosting your EPHI, so they have a they, their security rule, their risk assessment would be different, qualitatively different than someone that is actually has your PHI, your EPHI offsite. Uh, along those lines, back to server in the cloud. Uh, the question is, how are they, meaning the server in the cloud, held accountable? Well, that just I just yeah I just answered yeah. that they're held accountable. They're they're a business associate. They're held accountable statutorily. HHS can come after them, okay? And and um, right because they got to comply with the security rule. That's that's part of what the high tech high tech act did. But the question for you as covered entity is what how how did you what did you do what did you do to get the reasonable assurances that your business associates are doing the right thing? Right? If you just had them sign a contract, you never asked them about their policies, procedures, you never asked them maybe show us, talk to us about your last risk assessment, you never did any of those things, I think you're going to have a hard time when push comes to shove and you get an audit or you get a, a significant breach to make a good faith argument that you did your necessary due diligence to get satisfactory assurances. Okay, And that's another set of weasel words that are in the security rule. What did you do to get satisfactory? Uh, we signed them, had them sign a contract. Really? That's all? You didn't ask them for, you know, blah, blah, blah? And all, you know, you didn't ask them about the risk assessment? No. Okay. Well, then you're probably on the hook for negligence if you're being sued, you know, under a negligence theory in a class action lawsuit because your VA screwed up. Okay? So there's not that many places to hide here. Is uh, this is also along the same lines, and I believe you just answered it. Is a CE required to verify and inspect their BAs to ensure they are in compliance? What you're required to do is get satisfactory assurances. Now you tell me what that means. I'm, I'm going to tell you what it means. It means that it means whatever a court says it means at the end of the day, or a jury says it means. But if you did nothing. If you did nothing but have them sign the BA contract, I'm going to tell you that, you know, 100% of the time a judge and jury is going to say you probably didn't do what you should have done to get satisfactory assurances. Okay. So, like I said, there's not very many places to hide here. Yes, BAs are directly on the hook, but satisfactory assurances, that's the covered entity's responsibility. Or the BAs, if the BA has subs, 
right? Because now you have BAs of BAs of BAs. And that is the last question we have. Okay, so we've talked about this. You're going to have to do these more often than you thought. At a minimum, at a gross minimum, once a year, you probably should be doing them once a quarter. Uh, the responsible parties, you, your compliance officer, your executive team, you're all the organization is going to be on the hook, but it's definitely going to be fall on the ladder and on uh, the compliance officer for sure. Uh, so here's our shameless plug. We are doing a seminar um, in Tampa on surviving a HIPAA audit, and we're going to cover all 169 requirements that are part of HHS's protocol. The security rule will cover this risk assessment and, and go over uh, examples as part of our security rule uh, coverage, the privacy rule, and a breach notification rule. Uh, the presenter will be yours truly. You can click on these. It's, uh, the waterfront, waterfront suites, about 10 minutes from the airport, uh, right on the bay, a beautiful location. And um, together with this intense training, the idea is to answer your questions and get into more detail here on how you do specific things to get your uh, HIPAA initiative launched. As, as part of the cost here, we really require that you have a subscription plan, which means our products, because we're going to be talking about our products. So all the things that you saw, our templates and all that, are part of our uh, subscription plan. And so without that, really, the, the webinar is not really of much use to you. So if you're a, an existing subscriber, you already got a subscription plan. The cost is $700 for the day. If you're a non-subscriber, well, it's $1,495, but it's $1,495 because because we require you to get a subscription plan because it really doesn't make sense to uh, attend a, a sort of uh, intense product specific uh, description of how you go about solving some of these problems if you don't have the product, right? And once you have the subscription plan, you can reuse it because we have training videos that cover all this as well. So you, you not only benefit, but you can actually disseminate that information that you learn in our um, seminar to the rest of the organization. Uh, and as most of you know, we have uh, uh, products that you can buy individually. We have all our products that you can get for $7.95 a year uh, and $4.95 for the out years. So we like to think that we provide the recipe and not just the ingredients. We provide educational products you can execute on day one. You can click on these things and take a look inside some of our products. It might be useful to you. Uh, and one of the things that we're going to stress at uh, the seminar is the seminar is going to be at a requirement by requirement level. We're going to cover the 169 requirements of the HHS audit protocol because that's the only way you can really do deal with an audit. You don't need to be guessing about what the audit is going to be. The only thing possible the audit could be is the requirements. And HHS has published the requirements, and the requirements have always been in the rules. So you have to have policies, processes, and tracking mechanisms in place at the, at the level of a requirement if you're going to be able to provide visible demonstrable evidence that you're complying with that requirement and if you uh, have any hope of establishing a culture of compliance. And uh, if there are no more questions, then it's been my pleasure being with you today. I think we've got about five minutes, so Martin. We don't have any questions. Whoops. We have a thank you. No questions. Great. I appreciate that. It's, my, uh, it's, been, uh, it's been our pleasure being with you guys today. Thank you.